Thank you very much. Uh, so in this presentation, I'm going to talk about a high probability version of game theory. So uh, in the classical game theory, you want to guarantee payoffs in expected value. Now we want to guarantee a payoff with high probability. And the motivation uh, comes from information theory, where it's customary to require reliable communication with high probability. Um, so this is joint work with Payam Delgosha, who is currently a graduate student at Berkeley, and Mohammad Akbarpur, who is a professor of business school at Stanford. So I'm, what I'm going to do first is to define uh, the setup for repeated games with incomplete information. Um, so, um, so suppose there are two players, Alice and Bob. Uh, I denote the action of Alice by A and uh, action of Bob by B. And since it's a repeated game, I use AI to denote action of Alice at time step I and bi to denote action of bob at time state, uh, state i. I assume a zero sum game, so I only need to specify Alice's payoff. And Alice's payoff depends on ai, bi, and some state random variable s. So I have a g s of ai and bi. This state random variable is chosen at the beginning of the game, and it's fixed throughout the game. So it's chosen once and for all. Therefore, the average payoff of Alice would be this summation. Maybe I sh should show it here. The average payoff of Alice is this summation. And so I can think of this state as, like for each value of the state, I have a table. So I, I have multiple tables, basically, uh, the corresponding to different values of s. And so Alice and Bob are playing on one of these tables for the entire game. And uh, the game is played as follows. So at the beginning of the game, Alice and Bob get some side information about S. So initially, Alice gets SA, Alice's side information, and Bob gets SP. And S, SA, SP are correlated with each other. Um, then they play, they, they choose their actions, uh, and they can see the previous actions of each other, but they cannot see the, their payoffs. So if they can see their payoffs, they may be, able to, may, may be able to infer S, but they cannot see their payoffs. All that they can see are their pre the previous actions of each other. And um, now the challenge here is that uh, if one of the parties wants to use its information, then it can gain at the current stage, but it may leak information to the other party about the value of s, and that can be used against the, the party. So there's a trade-off between hiding and using information in the game. So this is the classical uh, setup. So, uh, so I they can privately randomize, yes. They can privately randomize. They Yes, there is a randomization S, like the table is either this one or this one, and they have some side information about that. Yeah. Uh, S A and S B R. Sorry. There are there's some joint distribution P S S S S A S B. It's just some joint distribution. S happens and you get some correlated variables with S. I mean that that's your side information. Oh, Alice wants to uh, so in, in Alice wants to basically maximize her gain, right? Are you looking at that or what? Um, yeah, so the uh, we are so in the like classical setup where we, are, we Alice wants to maximize expected value of this. I, I mean, I, I'll explain it in the next yeah. slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, it, I, so I assume, so the, I assume that, um, um, so it's, it's a zero sum game, right? So um, I can either assume that I know your strategy, it's a, I know your strategy and you know my strategy, I mean, it doesn't matter. I, I, there, 
it's a min max. I mean, I, I write the formulation and then maybe we can talk, get back to this on that slide. Um, so the strategy of Alice here is basically uh, AI given S, AI, SA, I minus one, the I minus one. These are the, stra the strategies of Alice. These conditional variables. All previous. All previous ones, yeah. The, the previous actions, the value of uh, side information, and this conditional distribution is the strategy of Alice at stage I. Yeah, this is 1 to i minus 1, sorry. Yeah, it's so 1 to i minus 1. Yeah. No, no, no. The value of the game is not known at all until, I mean, the end. I mean, the value of the game is not known. So the only way that you can obtain information is through the actions. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, this is like the standard setup, right? Because if you can see the if you can see the table from the first game, you can may be able to infer S, right? If I play something and you play something and I see my payoff, I can see which table, I mean on which table, you know, I can get that payoff and I can easily find S quickly, right? Um, this is the assumption, I mean. Um, so I'm going to apply this to a problem in information theory. There you can see that this setup is Interesting, but why game theories? Game theories they, like suggested this. I do not exactly. The, the table is the same. The table is going to same throughout. Yeah, but it's chosen at the beginning and fixed once and for all. Yes. Um, so, for instance, consider this example. S is binary here, so S is either S1 or S2, and uh, if S is S1, then Alice, this is Alice's action. Alice would like to play D because then she would gain one. I mean, it's like this, this row is more preferable to her. But if S is a student, this row is bad for her. So basically, if Bob can detect whether Alice has a preference of using the second row, and if Alice knows the state, then she can, he, Bob can infer some information. So there's this trade off of using and hiding information. Um, so since this is a zero-sum game, uh, a Nash equilibrium exists, and it's basically, you can write it as in the min-max form or max-min form. This alpha that I have written is this collection for i1 to n. This, the, all the strategies of Alice and all the strategies of Bob. Um, so Nash equilibrium. Nash equilibrium. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. And then the question is, what happens to the value of this game as n goes to infinity? So then there's a cl uh, classical result by Mertens and Zamir that uh, exactly tells you what this is. And I'm going to review it for a special case and also review its proof later. But so what classical game theory asks ask is that, what is the maximum value of R that Alice can guarantee, and guarantee means that expected value of uh, payoff is greater than R. So this is the uh, classical question of game theory. And what we ask is that we don't want expected value. We want sigma n itself to be greater than or equal to R with high probability. And that probability should go to 1 as n goes to infinity. Um, so there are some similarities and differences between the answers to this problem that uh, we will see. First of all, high probability guarantee can be strictly less than expected value guarantee. I mean, I'm going to show this through a simple example. Um, so in the average case, what uh, in the zero sum games, what I can guarantee is minus what you can guarantee. But here, it's, that's, not, that's no longer the case. What I can guarantee with high probability is not minus what you can guarantee with high probability. However, there is a similarity. Just like the average case, uh, if I'm a player and I know your strategy or I don't know your strategy uh, 
it's the same. I can guarantee the same. So there is a universal strategy basically for one player that works against all the strategies. Right? Nash has this property that if I'm playing Nash, then whatever strategy you have, um, I'm good. So it, this uh, high probability guarantees shame the same, share the same property. Um, so this is a simple example. Suppose S is equal to S1 or S2 with probability half. And if S is S1, we have this table on the left. And if S is S2, we have this table on the right. And say Alice and Bob do not know anything about S. So when do not know anything about S, uh, we can basically compute the average table. I take the average of the values, and I get this table. And as you can see, it's symmetric. So uniform strategy is optimal for both players. And Alice can guarantee 1.5 in expected value here. So with uh, uniform strategy, Alice can guarantee 1.5. But with probability half, you are in this table S1 here. And uniform is very bad here. Because with probability half, you are playing something very bad. So with probability half, your table S1 and your payoff would be minus 7 divided by 4. So even though you are guaranteeing 1.5 in expected value, with probability half, you are very bad. You are negative. However, suppose the strategy of Alice is just to play you all the time regardless of state, regardless of Bob's action. Then Alice can at least get one, right? Because this row, the two rows are the same, and the minimum is one. So with high probability, Alice can guarantee one. But in expected value, she can guarantee 1.5. But the two are different. And uh, the strategy of Alice is a non-equilibrium strategy, right? Here, just playing you all the time. Non-equilibrium in the sense that we know, non-Nash equilibrium. Um, okay. So now I want to motivate this high probability framework um, using two examples. Um, so suppose Alice and Bob are playing chess. And when Alice wins, uh, she gets a score of 1. When Bob wins, she gets a score of minus 1. And when they, it's a draw, they get 0. So they play this game n times. And what is important for Alice is that the summations of the scores are positive. right? This is all that Alice cares. She wants to more, more games. It's not important how many more games she wins. So this is, this is, this is she, she wants to maximize this probability, just this probability. She doesn't care about the expected value. She wins the entire game if she wins more games than Bob. Uh, so, and uh, I mean, we can find applications from information theory, like simple applications. Suppose you have a network. Alice sends a bit x i in 0, 1. And this bit gets either passed through or blocked. So it's an erasure channel. It's either x or it's blocked. And uh, this network has a state variable s. And there are two players, Alice and Bob. Alice wants to help the communication. Bob wants to disrupt the communication. So Bob wants to like, make this uh, block the communication. Alice wants to help. And what is important here is the number of bits that are passed through. If the number of bits, like you can ensure that half of the bits are passed through, then you can ensure a rate of 1 half. It's not important, like, I mean, if, the ex if you know that on average half of the bits are passed through, that's bad. Because with probability half, it may be the case that none of the bits are passed through. With probability half, all of them have passed through. So um, it makes sense that we want with high probability to have a payoff. Um, so let me review the classical result and the ideas. And then I will state uh, the main result for high probability. So I need to set up a few notations. Uh, so the game is uh, denoted by gamma n. This is the n stage game with uh, side information s a, s b, and state variable s. Then uh, when I want to emphasize s, I fix p s a, s b given s. and uh, I just write this as a function of p of s. So I have fixed 
SA and SP, condition on S. So this is just to emphasize that it's also a function of uh, PS. The value of the game is shown by V, of course. And uh, this notation UPS is when I uh, mix that, when I mix, suppose I mix the tables with probability PS and I get some average table uh, and the Nash value of that game. So when SA and SP, they don't know anything about S, then they are playing on the average table. And uh, so UPS would be the Nash value of that table. So when I change PS, I get different tables and the Nash, so it would be a function of PS. So in the rest of the talk, for, for the most part, I assume that Alice does not know anything. I mean, uh, if you're interested, you can look at our paper, but I mean, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, I just want to simplify it a little bit. So I assume that Alice does not know anything. Um, so as I said, this UPS is a function of PS and the result of uh, the result is that um, this limit, limit of the gain that Alice can gain, is the lower convex envelope of this function UPS. So basically, um, the Nash value is a function of PS, right? So, and the lower convex envelope is the uh, the lower convex envelope is the, low, the smallest concave function that is that lies below it. Oh, I forgot to say that here I'm also, oh, here I'm assuming that SP is equal to S. So I'm, this is a special case of the main theorem. Alice does not know anything. Bob knows the state, and uh, the limit of Alice's gain is the lower convex envelope. If Bob did not know anything, then the value would be this curve. Now, because Bob knows the state, it reduces, becomes smaller, it reduces to this curve. However, if you are on this, the places where the curve matches its concave envelope, uh, there is no, I mean, uh, Bob having a, st a state or not having it is the same. Basically, it's bad for Bob to use her state, his state. Um, so is there any question about this? The axis is P of S, yes. This is the probability simplex on S. And you have, this is just a one dimensional curve, but you have the probability simplex and value of Nash value of U, and then on that curve, you are doing the lower convex envelope. So as the, as the value of S instantiates, so that Bob knows where he is, and then Bob can't use that value, that's the, like, the lower convex envelope. Right, yeah. So, so suppose you are here. Suppose you are here. I mean, I will. I will tell, uh, I will go through the proof of this. There are two sides to this. But maybe you can comment on the other very simple case in which there are two tables uh -huh. with probability one half. Uh -huh. And Alice and Bob, no of them has any information. Oh, then it's just UPS, right? UPS is defi definition. By definition, UPS is the situation where nobody knows the table. And then, and then, then they are then they are playing on the average table, right? So you can combine the two tables with two probabilities. But, but you, you, you convinced us that there is a difference. No, this is the expected value regime. This is the classical result. Oh, not, for, not, for, for not for high probability. Sorry, yeah, for high probability it will be different. Yeah. yeah, sorry. This is just just I want to just go through the classical okay, result. UPS is for average. UPS is for average. Nash value of. Uh, Alice for the average, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm going to tell you the proof. Once part of it is obvious, so the Bob's strategy, so Bob wants to ensure that Alice does not get more than this amount, right? So Bob can take, create some random variable V according to V given S and announce V and then forgets S. So with this strategy, when V is equal to V, game would continue on the marginal distribution of S given V. And therefore, the payoff would be P of V, this is the probability that V occurs, times the Nash uh, value of, that Alice can guarantee, uh, P of S given V. Now, if you look at this expression, it's just a weighted sum of U at different points. And uh, with proper choice of V, you can reach the VEX, right? If you are here, you would choose P of S given V1 to be here, P of S given V2 
two to be here, and then with averaging, you can reach this point. Okay. Um, so one side is clear. Now the other side is we want to prove that Bob cannot avoid Alice getting this low, this this much. And so this is my way of rephrasing their proof. They don't use mutual information and all that. But I'm, I mean, I, I like mutual information. So this is, I think it's kind of the same idea, but written in terms of mutual information. So let me define Ji to be the information of Alice at stage i. So Alice is, Alice at the beginning does not know anything. Bob knows the state s. So information of Alice gradually increases. And uh, I'm writing this mutual information between s and a1 to i minus 1, b1 to i minus 1 to be the information of Alice at stage i. So it's an increasing sequence. And uh, there are some places where the information increases slightly, but there might be some jumps, right? So a jump is a place where the information increases by more than delta. Delta is a small number. If so I call this a jump. This is also a jump. It increases. And the set i is indices where jump does not occur. So basically, the information of Alice does not change. Now I claim that this set i is basically essentially all the indices. There are except few indices. You can have few jumps. And the reason is that ji is at most entropy of s. It's a mutual information. It's at most entropy of s. And in each jump, you have delta. So you can have at most h of s divided by s jumps, which is a constant. So essentially, uh, the locations that there is no jump is greater than n minus k. Therefore, your payoff uh, would be approximately the same payoff if, if you compute it on the instances where there is no jump. And if there is no jump, it means that uh, Alice is, has ended up at some p of s given information. And they are playing. Alice can guarantee u of this, uh, like the, her Nash equilibrium at this particular distribution, right? So, uh, and this, this is always greater than or equal to vex. Right. No, no. So if, if there is no information, it means that Bob has not used her information. Uh, Bob has not used. If Bob does not use his information, then Alice can guarantee u of that, the, the, this conditional distribution. Right? Alice can guarantee u of this if Bob does not use his information. So therefore, the average payoff of Alice would be something like that. And then this is greater than or equal to vex. It's a weighted average. So this is the, basically the idea. Uh, now I want to state the main result for the high probability case. So I want to prove that it's basically instead of the lower convex envelope, you get the minimum. Minimum of US over all PS. That would be the high probability, the value that Alice can guarantee with high probability. So let us see an example. Suppose uh, there are two tables, one here, one here. And this table is chosen with probability p1. This table is chosen with probability one minus p and 1 minus p. So then u of p would be p times 1 minus p. That can be calculated. And the minimum would be minus 1 over 4. So this is the curve, right? Minus p, ti p times mi minus p times 1 minus p is like this. And the minimum is 1 over 4. So Alice can guarantee minus 1 over 4 with high probability. Um, but the thing is, uh, Bob has to be smart here, right? Bob knows the state. If Bob just wants to, like, say, Bob knows it's S1, and then if Bob uses, plays L in the first game, Alice would learn that it's S1, and uh, then Alice would uh, uh, always play D, for instance, right? So the same, so my, my point is that the same hiding and using information uh, trade-off exists even in the high probability case. It's not that when we go to high probability, that challenge is removed. No, that same challenge exists. And, uh, but then this is the answer. Um, OK. Now, so how can we prove this, this claim? Um, So 
So one part of it, um, um, so f first assume that um, Q of, uh, P of S is exactly here. If P of S is exactly here, then we know that Alice cannot guarantee more than this in expected value, right? Therefore, they cannot guarantee more than this in, with high probability, right? So when, when P of S is exactly here, then we know the answer. And uh, um, I want to claim that if P of S is here, then again, Alice cannot guarantee more than this. So, th so the proof has two parts. First, I need to prove that Alice cannot guarantee more than this, and then show that there is a way for Alice to guarantee it, right? So to prove that Alice cannot guarantee this, assume that P of S is here, someplace here. Then um, I, um, I claim that uh, if I change P of S and bring it to here, the amount that basically the value does not depend on P of S. Because uh, each value of S occurs with some pr positive probability, right? And if you want to guarantee something with high probability, then you have to guarantee it for every value of S. Because each value of S has a positive probability. If the overall, you have to guarantee something with probability going to 1, you have to guarantee it for every single value of S. Therefore, it doesn't matter what distribution S has. So you, you, if you move from here to here, uh, you cannot, I mean, the problem does not change. And here, we know that in expected value, we can guarantee this. Therefore, we are done. I mean, Alice can, can never go above this curve. Any questions here? And this is the simpler part. I think yeah, yeah, this is the support, under support. I have, like, uh, there are some details, yeah. And under support, assuming that you keep the support fixed, then, yeah. So now for the other part, um, I want to assume that without loss of generality, we can assume that Bob knows the state. I mean, if I'm Alice and I want to guarantee something with high probability, even if Bob does not know the state, I can assume that he knows it. Because Bob can with guess the state, with some probability it will be correct. And so under that event, I have to be able to guarantee my payoff. So even if Bob does not know the state, that knows the state, I have to do it. And so, so if I give um, Bob full information, it, nothing changes. Now, so I want to guarantee, show that Alice can guarantee um, this much. Uh, now, I can write this as minimum over P of S of vex of UPS. And, uh, I can guarantee this as, I can write this as minimum P of S, minimum over beta, maximum over beta of value of, this is approximately. So I can find an n large enough such that this quantity is close to this, right, by that theorem. Now, uh, if we look at this, it's like minimum over beta, this beta is let me write it more explicitly. This is b, beta i of uh, b i given a 1 i minus 1, b 1 i minus 1, and s. Okay? So I want to interpret this and this. I want to create a new game where the action of Bob is both, p of, is both s and this beta. So I'm I want to construct a new game. In this new game, Bob chooses the state S first. Bob chooses state S. But Alice cannot see this action of Bob. Then Bob chooses BI uh, according to S and uh, previous actions of Alice. And Alice chooses AI according to AI1 minus 1 and B1I minus 1. Okay? Then this quantity is nothing but the Nash value of this new game. Right? So this quantity is then, is, this is the Nash value of this new game where Bob is selecting S at the beginning. Okay, so therefore Alice has a strategy. I can change max and mean, right? 
uh, Alice has a strategy that would guarantee this payoff on average over this game, right? Okay. So let's take that strategy, and I want to repeat this ga n game m times. So this is like a block. This is the game. I want to. This this is an n game. Another n game. Another n game. So I'm going to repeat it m times. And I assume that Alice is playing her Nash strategy in an IID way for each game. Okay. Now, um, if I look at the payoff of Alice, it's a super martingale. Because uh, now Bob can correlate between these, his actions in the games. But if you look at, like, say, a certain number of games, Alice is playing IID here. And no matter what Bob plays, he would get at least this much in expected value. Therefore, um, if I look at Alice's payoff uh, over like these blocks, it, it would be a super martingale. And um, now, using the fact that this uh, martingale is bounded, you can use Azuma's lemma and then show that when the number of games increases, Alice can guarantee her payoff with high probability. Basically, so you can go from expected value to high probability. How much time do I have? Um, let's say you know, it's a little more than 15 minutes. So oh, 15 minutes. So I was very <laughs> fast again. I wanted to be slower. <laughs> so can you explain what that is for, for the simple, the simple example. So we have two games. Uh huh. Games, uh huh. And Alice uh, doesn't know which game. The probability one count. Okay. Uh huh. Like I have to. Uh -huh. Right. So let me. I have some examples. Is that stable good or not? No. It is very. Like minus one zero 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 minus one. Is this table good enough? This is a trivial table. Yeah, if the if he wants if if Alice wants to guarantee with high probability, yes, yeah. the average is the best. What would the strategy in general be? So if you have two games, right? Uh, in one, Alice has a better average, right? But there are still optimal uh, right. for Neumann strategies right. for these two games. Yeah. But the strategy for the best best strategy yeah. for the first game. Which is, which is minimal. Yeah, I'm not giving a, a strategy for Alice in an explicit way here. The no, strategy but is. You can see what will happen on this move. So, so we, have, yeah. we have one strategy. If we know that the game is less, 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 if Alice knows that, and yeah. yes, Alice, if we know that this is be our bad game, mm. then we have strategy and we guarantee some. Right. Right. No, let me. Uh, uh, what I know is that in the average case, suppose it's not high probability, in the average case, while we know the value of the game in the limit, but we, nobody knows what are the strategies of Alice and Bob. The optimal strategies of like. No, no, so the, um, no, no, no. No, so. Um, so you. you, you it's a zero-sum game. You might have different Nash strategies, right? But they all give the same value. So you're looking for one particular Nash point, right? That this is your question. No, no. In, in general case, no. Of course, it can be somehow redundant, mm -hmm. but normally there is there is one. But, but anyway, imagine yeah. some game, two games, bad uh -huh. game and good game. We are okay. Right. So one is bad for us, other is good for us. Right, right. So in, in bad game, we can guarantee to win one. Right. Right, right. And there is some strategy, unique strategy, which guarantees winning one. Right, right. So, does Alice know anything or not? Does Alice? So it's Alice does not know anything. Bob knows the table, right? Now, if Bob plays in a way that Alice can infer that it's a bad table or good table, you know, Bob. So, so here to achieve this result, uh, I I said that I mean. One strategy for Bob is simply reveal some information at the beginning and then forget about the rest. I think with and then Alice playing IIT. So I think this is one Nash equilibrium. Still can assume, consider the example. Uh -huh. But in, in a bad good game and good game, mm -hmm. the Bob strategy is the same. The only difference is that Alice knows the table. Right. Uh -huh. Right. Uh -huh. 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 Uh
optimal Bob strategy is the same. But our strategies are different. No, a strategy of Bob depends on the value of S, right? It's a con I yeah, mean yeah. for the first game and for the second. If, if it's right, so that means that Bob is not using his information about S. If Bob is using yeah, the same strategy, the no. So the the optimal thing for Bob is to publicly say something about S at the beginning, like say that Bob Bob says that okay, S is either one, two, or three, four, for instance, and then from that point on, for one, two, Bob uses the same strategy. For three and four, uses the same strategy. Basically, this is the type of thing that no, leads to a Nash. Okay. So he uses strategy. But for Alice, there are two different strategies. One strategy in the first game we can guarantee one. Mm -hmm. But this strategy for the second game is terrible. And in the second game to guarantee two, we need to use some better strategy. So then you somehow claim that we can guarantee one with high probability. And this I cannot understand how, how it's possible in this case. Um. Kind of no, it's even smaller, right? So the worst, so with wor the worst P of S that you can imagine. So, there, so, so the worst P of S in your case is all the probability going on one. So this curve reaches its minimum at like at the boundary, right? So in your example, if S is all one, it's worst for Alice, right? So this curve is not like this. This curve is starts from here and goes up. So then the minimum is exactly here. So the, but, but the question, how can we guarantee one? Because if we use a strategy which is guarantees one for the first game, this would be very te terrible for us in the second. No, if, no, no the thing is, if Bob, if Bob reveals something to Alice about S, it's then it's better for Alice. So Bob does not do anything, and Alice would just guarantee the minimum. Yeah, so this is, this is, okay, this is the magic that you can ex exchange alpha and like man, mix, min and max, right? So here I'm assuming that Bob is even choosing S. Not only S is chosen, Bob is actively choosing S. And then you can, the, the min and max exchange. So there exists a strategy for Alice. I, I'm not saying what it is. But regardless of how Bob actually chooses S, Alice can guarantee. This is, I mean, existence of this is, this is just a proof, right, yeah. But this is. Yeah, so this max and mean, I mean, it's strange. So. Yeah, so, right. So there, there is a very easy example when uh, Bob's move doesn't matter. So in the first game, Alice uh, should play, say, zero, in the second game, one. Yes. And yeah. Put them the repeatedness of the game. Repeatedness is important, repeated. and, repeated. yeah. Okay, the game is not once, yeah, so it's repeated. So not know anything about Bob. No. You can see Bob can. No, Bob has a strategy, right? Right. Actually, there are two things. And one is you. Yeah. So. No. No. So the thing is, yeah. This is the thing. I mean, if 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 so, if Alice knows the strategy of Bob. Right, how he's, he's choosing the state S and how he's playing, then it's, okay, it's more natural that we can come up with an explicit alpha. But once you exchange this max and mean, this universal alpha that works for everything, I mean, I don't think it's, uh, one can easily specify what that is.
Right. Right. And then yeah. they decide if the other is game. Right. Yeah, right. Because, right. Because the real game can be different from the average. Yeah. And then we don't have any high probability variety. But the real, the, at least that's not the worst game. That's what he's saying. At least as good as the worst game. He's saying that it's at least as good as the worst game. Right. So if you play the optimal side, <laughs> yeah, it's, anyways, it's so in the math here. <laughs> No, Alice knows the strategy of Bob or not. Alice going to do half half. He's, he's going to flip half half and then go and guarantee him as good. No, if Al Alice is flipping half half, that guarantees average over S. But, so it's. No, okay, so okay, okay, imagine that's not minus 1, but minus 10. Okay, you're right, minus 10. Um, and the minimum was still 1. I don't understand. No, no, minimum will be, minimum will be minus 10, right? Because if, no. if the state was 2. No, in the first strategy, in the first game, our ALS strategy is one. It's, 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 it's no, so, it's no, so, so, so what do you, know, maybe I should write it, huh? Yeah, so what, what is exactly? Right, so there are two phases. Oh, Bob does not have any action? Okay, well, it's good, okay. <laughs> no, no, it's right. So the second one. Okay. Imagine that that is one. Okay, this is one. Uh -huh. And this is minus 10. Minus 10. And second is minus, minus 10. Minus 10. And 2. 2, so okay. First okay. Alice can one. Okay, let, let me compute what I, Alice can guarantee. Yeah. In this, okay, so, so, so I have to take P, let's choose P and minus, one, minus P. So this is like P minus ti 10 times 1 minus P, and then minus 10 P plus 2 times 1 minus p. And uh, so Alice's strategy would be to choose the maximum of this, right? So u of p would be the maximum of this. And then the minimum of the maximum, right? So you take this would be maximum of, what is it? p minus p, 11p minus 10 and 2 minus 12p, and then you take minimum yeah, over p. Yeah, yeah, So now I'm going to apply this to uh, like a serious problem in information theory to say that this is just not some like. I mean, it's, so I'm l going to look at a compound arbitrary varying channel. How much time do I have? Sorry. Now a little more than five minutes. So okay, but five minutes I'll just wrap it up. Okay, so it's um, there is a state S here. It's chosen at the beginning and fixed throughout the game, so it's like a compound channel. But there is also an adversary that has input A, and this adversary has some side information about S at the beginning. Um, uh, there is also input x and the output y, so we want to communicate over this and we assume <coughs> infinite shared randomness between the transmitter and receiver. So there is, as I said, there is a state variable s. Um, I'm going to assume that the encoder and decoder are one player and then the adversary is another player. So I'm going to give the same uh, channel state information to the encoder and decoder, but the channel state information to adversary is like, can be different. Um, then Alice gets a message M, and Alice creates X1 from S of X and M, and adversary creates A1 from S, S of A, and Bob gets Y1, then uh, I'm going to assume that uh, the encoder observes the action of the adversary, also the decoder observes it, A1, I'm, I have to make this assumption. S uh, and then uh, the adversary also observes the encoder's input, and so they choose X2, A2, and then Y2, and this game continues, and at the end of the day you want to decode M. So it's a compound AVC channel, but 
The only weakness of this is I have assumed that y includes a. So y b decoder is also observing a. So y is like the pair y, some y and a. So this is, um, and then we can, uh, okay. Then we can exactly compute the capacity of this. So there are some, uh, this part is for s of x, let's forget about s of x. So it's minimum over p of s, minimum over p of a, maximum over p of x of this mutual information. Now if you set a to be a constant, like disable a, you get a compound channel. And if you disable s, you get a, a, an AVC channel, but with the assumption that a is available at y. So the converse here is very easy. Um, Bob can simply uh, take some p of a, regardless of his state variable s, and I, I play iid p of a. So you can get the converse. To prove the achievability of this, we construct an auxiliary game. Um, so the auxiliary game is that the, ac I, the action of the first player is a probability distribution. The action of Bob is a symbol in A. And uh, the payoff, let me, the payoff would be the mutual information between uh, the input distribution on X and Y conditioned on the choice, Bob's adversary's action and the state variable. So basically, I'm constructing a game with mutual information as the payoff, okay? And if this summation, uh, if we can guarantee that this summation is large, then um, we have enough buildup of mutual information to be able to decode a message at rate R. Uh, so there are some like code book constructions and all that, but I'm not sure how much of, of it would be to interest to CS people. Like, I, I'm, I'm out of time, right? You have a couple of minutes. Couple of minutes. So I just explained the code book generation then. So, so you have the game. The game tells you at the first stage, uh, the input distribution pi 1 and the action a1 from sx and sa. So I generate 2 to the nr random code words. This is, so this is using the shared randomness between the encoder and the decoder. They generate 2 to the nr iid code words from this distribution pi 1. And then Alice sends, uh, if the message is 1, Alice puts x1 of 1 on the input of the channel. Then we look at the game in the second stage of the game. If the action of uh, is pi two, we generate x two from that distribution. So we look at the distributions that the player is playing and create the code book according to that distribution as we go on. Um, right. Yeah. So this is the code book. And then we have to do some at the decoder. We have to do some jointly typical decoding, but it's a little bit complicated, more complicated than like the way you do it normally. Um, but then this can be done. I mean, if there is enough mutual, total mutual information, you would be able to decode your message correctly. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you.